Hello viewers, my name is Tyler Marchand, and today I'm going to be talking about my picks for the best hit songs of 1968. Man, if there ever was a turbulent year that would make what's going on in the US today seem like child's play, then it would be 1968. Martin Luther King's assassination led to hundreds of race riots across the country. But while I'm not here to compare unrest in the US between now and 50 years ago, I'm here to talk about music from 50 years ago. And this year was very good for music. You, you might not get that from first impression on my list because I'm only talking about 14 songs today, but as usual, there were quite a few songs that came close to making it for me, but just fell short. Such tracks included People Got To Be Free, Mrs. Robinson, Hello I Love You, Angel of the Morning, Ain't Nothing Like The Real Thing, You're All I Need To Get By, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. Before you go hitting the dislike button for not putting the latter on this list, I do like the song and appreciate the lyrics. However, it loses points because James Brown himself was not that involved in the civil rights movement of the early 1960s, and it is truly ironic that the sign title is chanted by kids that were mostly white or Asian. <laughs> Anyways, looking back to 1969 one last time, I'm retroactively upgrading Suspicious Minds to an honorable mention. Now the four honorable mentions. In 1969, I had a version of this song from the French Distinction as an honorable mention. Now we get to the original, and man, this is not what I was expecting. For one, this song is actually just an instrumental, unlike the 1969 version, which had lyrics and was a tad bit faster paced. Here, South African jazz musician Hugh Masekela lets the instrumentation paint a picture of the grasslands of the African continent, and it is a gorgeous symphony. I still like the interpol from 1969, but this is clearly the superior version. Back in my 1987 list, I mentioned that Billy Idol's most famous hit was actually a cover of a psychedelic rock track from almost 20 years earlier. It's not often that I say this, but the Billy Idol cover is by far the superior version of this track. But that doesn't mean that this song still doesn't kick ass, because it does. Even if that two bar drum pattern that's repeated more than 40 times in the bridge kind of makes it feel clunky. Even then, I wouldn't have a problem listening to this song if the Billy Idol version weren't available. For those who don't know, Big Brother and the Holding Company were a psychedelic rock group formed during the massive wave of 1965 and featured the late Janis Joplin on vocals. This is a cover of a track from Aretha Franklin's oldest sister, Irma, and while nowhere near as soulful as Franklin's original, Janis Joplin's raspy performance is compelling enough for her to have a rightful claim to this song as well. I mainly hear the song nowadays through a country version courtesy of Faith Hill, but the older versions are truly special. This is one of those tracks that just draws you in from the moment it starts playing. That groovy guitar lick that plays throughout the verses really sets the mood for this track about the narrator's relationship with the girl of his dreams. And then when that saxophone solo comes in halfway through, another layer of fantastic music is added to this already phenomenal track. Alright, and those are my four honorable mentions. Again, don't be fooled by the scant number of honorable mentions in this video. Like I said, if I allowed 7 out of 10s for this video, then the list would have been about 50% longer. And don't even ask me if I were to include 6s. So let's get into the meat of this list, shall we? Number 10. I don't know how to say this, but this is yet another song that I was first introduced to in my childhood through cinema. Anybody remember the first Shrek movie? I think in the, uh, in some of the, uh, 
home releases, the, the, the post credit scene featured the main characters doing karaoke in the swamp, and one of those songs lands here as my number 10 pick. This was the breakthrough hit for the racially integrated Sly and the Family Stone, a group from San Francisco. They are most known for songs with social commentary, but here the group are only focused on making a groovy dance track. This kind of fits more in the mold of thank you for letting me be myself again than in the mold of everyday people. And man do they deliver. The layout of this track is quite unorthodox, I'll just say that. For the bulk of the track, guitarist Freddie Stone lets you know what instruments are going to be added into the mix. And every time I listen to this track, the introduction of the new instruments is still novel and unexpected. That tells a lot about how special tracks that are out of the box can be, and this certainly is one of those. Number 9. My understanding is that this guy is really beloved for another hit that I'll eventually be getting to, but this minor hit is actually very good in its own right. Come 1966, I will be talking about Percy Sledge's masterpiece, When a Man Loves a Woman. Just mark that down right now, it's coming. But for now, here is a minor hit from the same man that a certain no-talent ass clown desecrated a quarter century after the fact. This soulful love song doesn't follow the same formula that you'd expect most of these types of songs to follow. When I pulled up the song and start listening through it, I thought it would be a song about Percy Sledge telling a friend not to rush into a relationship. But alas... It is Percy Sledge himself who rushed into the relationship, and it's his family, and even the preacher that weds him and his fiance that is that suspects that there is more to the fiance than what she is letting on. But he's so blind to the love that he doesn't listen to these concerns, and later finds out she is unfaithful. The vocal delivery really sells the idea of someone who just threw everything he had at this woman only to get heartbroken, and it is fantastic. Number 8. When people hear the name Steppenwolf, the first thing that people will associate this Canadian group with is their hit Born to be Wild. Personally, I understand why people will make that connection, but perhaps people should start associating Steppenwolf with this song instead. More so than Born to be Wild, this song truly leans into the psychedelic rock mold that was very popular in the late 60s, conjuring up images of Aladdin and Jasmine during that whole new world sequence from the, uh, from the 93 movie. Those organs really help sell the idea of this as a psychedelic classic, and strangely, the reason why I specifically mention that mention Aladdin and the whole new world thing is because vocalist John Kay insists that this wasn't inspired by an acid trip. Even though the lyrics still fit in with about a fantastical world, which does work with the Aladdin analogy. Anyway, this is awesome stuff. Number seven. Man, the things I learn about songs that I am familiar with when I listen through these years, you'll be amazed at how much of it surprises me. This is one of those songs that I've known about for years, but I never knew who originally made it. When listening through this year, I come to find out that it is made from the same group that made a Guitar Hero classic, Sunshine of Your Love. But what really surprised me when I looked up some background for this song was that the lyrics were born from a poem. I'm not kidding. <laughs> But Eric Clapton really steals the show on this track with his guitar work that is very heavy on the wah effects that Jimi Hendrix popularized. What is even more ironic about the influences for this guitar work is that Guitar World has only one guitar solo higher ranked than White Rooms.
that's like was one of the few videos I could find for this one, but that's a live shot of Voodoo Child courtesy of Jimi Hendrix himself. Anyway, for those who aren't familiar with White Room, you need to change that immediately. Number six. This is one of those songs where I have to put my political views aside to enjoy it, but even then, it is still a very good song. I might be stepping into a political minefield with this entry, but I don't care. Musically, this Beatles track leans more into the hard rock mold, which I do appreciate, but now I have to talk about the lyrics. There's really nothing objectionable about them, it's John Lennon speaking his mind about the Vietnam War. What really trusts me is when Lennon takes digs at people who look up to former chairman Mao Zedong, when two years later he would have a hit song that, even if it was unintentional, almost reads out like a communist manifesto. I've made it pretty clear in some in some of my older videos that I'm completely against far left viewpoints. But with that minor quibble out of the way, the song is still very good. The track would have admittedly been higher if not for that moment that dabbles with hypocrisy, but I still like it nonetheless. Number five. Even back in this time when instrumental tracks were a lot more commonplace than in today's Billboard charts, I don't think I've ever come across one that was the number one song of the year. Admittedly, this song wasn't the song of the year, but it was this close. Composer Paul Mariat really struck gold with his remake of a French tune of the same name. It is called Love is Blue, and it is truly lovely to listen to. Right from the get-go, the guitar work takes you away to a beautiful place. And then twinkling keys add yet another layer to this gorgeous song. When I say that this song was this close to being the song of the year, I mean it. Because it had that position in the bag until number four. This song entered, became along very late in the year, like it was released at the end of August. In today's Billboard charts, the song of the year is typically one that was that is that had been on the charts since the beginning of the year, or at the very least, when winter turns into spring. Aside from this, the only instance I can think of where a song defines the year very late into the Billboard year would be the Princess Diana version of Elton John's "Candle in the Wind" back in 1997. And it is amazing that this song, which clocks in at over 7 minutes, topped the year-end charts. Background behind this song is very touching. John Lennon's song, son, Julian, was going through a hard time when his parents divorced, so bandmate Paul McCartney wrote this track to comfort the distraught child. The track is notably two in one. The soft piano ballad that I'm pretty sure, which is one part that people really love about the song, takes up the first three minutes of this song. Well, the last four minutes of the song is where you get that na 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 segment. Normally, four minutes of basically the same lyrics over and over again would get old in record time, but I actually don't mind it here. In other words, this is a fantastic track, and we're only at number four. Strap yourselves in. Number three. If it weren't for some background research into another song that I was planning on putting on this list, 
this would have been yet another video where my preferences for rock music would have won out. Once you find out what these rock songs are, you will have no ex you have you will you will not be allowed to blame me at all. I don't know how successful I may have been with my little fake out earlier in the video, but both of Cream's major hits are making this list. White Room has the iconic guitar solo, but this song has the iconic guitar riff, and I think people tend to remember riffs more. This one courtesy of Eric Clapton. I mean, that's just heavenly to listen to. It's riff like it's riffs like these where I wish I'd taken up guitar in my younger years. Lyrics read out as Eric Clapton planning a romantic evening, and the blues instrumentation makes me really feel the warmth that this relationship brings. And on the topic of that potent of a potentially another failed fake out, number two. Do I really need to explain why this song is fucking awesome? Okay, but only since you asked. Magic Carpet Ride is a great song, but there was no way that I was going to not put this song on the list. I've mentioned in the past how songs tend to get popular due to them being featured in cinema, but this is a song that actually had a bit of a reverse effect. One year after the song became a smash, it was used as a theme song to a motorcycle movie called Easy Rider. The rugged guitar work really helps sell the idea of one driving through the countryside on two wheels. Hell, even on four wheels, this song is a blast to listen to. I tend to be a stickler for rules on the road, but even when I'm listening to this song, I just feel like a complete badass who owns the pavement. It's that good. <laughs> Up until about my last ordering of this list, I had this song as my number one, but something changed. Number one. Listening through this year will have been the first time ever that I had heard this song. It, it had been generally regarded before, my understanding, as one of the best number one hits of all time, if not the best. My initial ordering for the songs on this list, I actually had this at number three. The touching story behind the track ultimately gave it the push it needed to overtake two rock classics, or at least they're classics in my mind. Why is it that songs that artists make just before their untimely deaths are just masterpieces beyond reproach? Why is it that it's only the ones that they're recording when they die that they are, are the ones that we remember the most. Once the song starts, the atmosphere is instantly set by the sounds of the ocean. Hearing the uh, sound of the ocean there is just really calming and and then the lyrics, you have Otis Redding describing how he traveled cross-country from Georgia to the San Francisco Bay Area to work in the shipyards, only to find out that this place is not as he had envisioned, but because he'd spent too many resources to make the 2,000-mile journey back home, he has no choice but to just watch the ships in the harbor as, they, as a pastime, just lamenting on life choices that he made. That whistling end is the most haunting aspect of the song, as it was supposed to be just a placeholder until Otis could come up with a third verse for the song. That ver third verse never happened because the plane that he was taking back to Tennessee crashed into a lake in Madison, Wisconsin during the heart of winter, I should add. I can only wonder what the song would have sounded like with that extra verse, but as is, this song is almost perfect and is an easy pick for the best hit song of 1968. Well, that was my list. Thank you all for watching. If you liked the video, share it with others so that I can continue to grow my channel. 
subscribe to my channel for notifications of new content or notifications in general, and as always, leave your thoughts in the comments section below. Okay, that was a great year, but the truly amazing stuff is what really stood out above the rest. I, I mean it, if I were to allow songs that were sixes or sevens, then this year would have been really good, but I just really think that, I honestly believe that 8 out of 10 is a really good threshold to use because that is, that indicates way above average quality. But for my next video, I've heard that there is going to be amazing stuff all around. So I'm looking forward to talking about 1967. I intend to have that video out on Wednesday, September 23rd. Stay tuned for then. Until that video comes out, I'm Tyler Marchand. Take care and stay safe.